great pleasure that I would like to welcome you, Jenny Hendricks, to this exclusive interview on the occasion of the International Open Access Week. Being a strong advocate of open scholarly infrastructure, I'm sure the scholarly community is awaiting to get insights from you that they have been seeking for always. Since 2015, Jenny has been instrumental in shaping and leading the community team at Crossfit. Her portfolio encompasses a diverse range of responsibilities, including community engagement and communications, member experience, technical support, and metadata strategy. Prior to her tenure at Crossfit, Jenny spent a decade at Adi, where she provided invaluable consultancy services within scholarly communications. In 2018, Jenny founded the Metadata 2020 Collaboration, a visionary initiative advocating for richer, connected, reusable, and open metadata. She has been a guiding force behind several open infrastructure initiatives, including ROR, the Research Organization Registry, and POSI, the Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure. Not one to rest on her laurels, Jenny recently founded Force 11's Upstream Community Blog, a hub dedicated to all things open research. So as we delve into this interview, we look forward to gaining insights from your wealth of experience, Jenny, and your visionary leadership in championing open access and the advancement of scholarly communication. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm very flattered to be invited and hope I have something useful to say. Thank you. Definitely, we are sure to. So, to start with, just in one sentence, if you could share your experience on the evolution of open access over the years and its influence on scholarly communication, what would that be? Uh, well, it's been a fairly slow um, and bumpy road, um, but where access has been opened, it's had a hugely positive effect on scholarly communications as a whole ecosystem. And one one effect that comes to mind is the growth of newer fields like meta research. So the ability for science to analyze itself and report on itself. Um, some people call it research on research or meta research. Um, and that wouldn't be as easy without open access to, um, to articles and other content. Yeah. So uh, like you said, but uh, considering that you're in shaping community engagement at CrossFit, how do you see the balance between community-driven initiatives and commercialization in the context of open scholarly infrastructure? Yes, this is interesting because um, often people conflate non-profit with open, but that's not always the case. Uh, there are some uh, commercial uh tools and and platforms and you know workflows that are very open have open code open data and conversely there are non-profits that are um you know have sales targets and and things like that so it is possible to be a non be a for-profit initiative that also has you know forkable code and data and i think commercial efforts are not inherently bad for science um but they're usually not foundational infrastructure, but more like services built on top. Um, so they all rely on the kind of underlying infrastructures like Crossref, Orchid and Datasite. Um, but yeah, some uh, some of those tools built on top of the, the foundational infrastructure are really valuable. They, they're useful, they add value. Um, and they're, they're the ones often pushing people like us to improve because they have... They work a bit faster and they're looking for, you know, more comprehensive open data to build on um, and things like that. And it's sometimes quite hard to tell whether an organization or a, a, a search tool or whatever is truly open. Um, but there are uh, um, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure that you mentioned at the beginning, which I wasn't um, a writer of initially, but have adopted those principles Um as Crossref and uh, a couple of other initiatives I'm involved with. So those principles uh, are just principles. <laughs> so that means they can be a little bit interpreted. And uh, about 15 infrastructures now have audited themselves against those principles and nobody's doing it perfectly, but it's a way for the community to kind of assess who is at least 
working towards that, who cares about, um, you know, uh, the ability to, if if they fail, is everything available for the community to recreate it in a different way? That's kind of like an insurance policy in a way. Um, and yeah, it would be great if some of the bigger commercial infrastructures or services would, you know, challenge themselves and, you know, to challenge themselves to more open governance uh, with open code, open data. It's definitely possible. Um, so it'd be great if some of the big, the, the tools that people rely on, you know, Google Scholar or, uh, you know, Dimensions or something like that could also consider uh, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And then it would be all comparable and people could see who's working towards a more open infrastructure future. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, the more point that you mentioned, that there are several uh, community-driven initiatives and open access initiatives that we can have launched. Uh, you have been a very strong advocate of open access infrastructure and open scholarly infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You launched the, like, you founded the Metadata 2020 collaboration. Uh, in that sense, how do you think has this initiative impacted the scholarly landscape? And mm -hmm. what challenges and opportunities do you foresee for open metadata in the future? Okay, yes. Um, well, M metadata it has had an impact that that campaign metadata 2020 so it, i now see metadata on the agenda of almost every conference <laughs> that um that is is going on in this space um so it's been read in indirect i think and not only attributable to metadata 2020 of course but we at, at crossref have seen a very steady increase in our members providing more metadata enriching their metadata records um and we have seen, you know, more people asking us, what can we do to improve our metadata um, in Crossref? So it has had an impact, um, whether it's direct or indirect, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I see metadata as a an absolute necessity for open science, um, including open access. And there is there will be no open science without open metadata. Like that is, that's like my, <laughs> my catchphrase, I think. Um, so those same efforts on meta research or research on research rely heavily on open metadata. Um, and even while some publishers, you know, are needing to retain their more traditional fee models, um, the, the efforts that they're making in open metadata does show their direction of travel, I think. Um, and I think, you know, you talked about sort of challenges. Sometimes it's really technically difficult, um, smaller younger you know one person journals find it really difficult to generate metadata but there are tools and platforms that help them with that that are also open and free like open journal systems from um, the public knowledge project for example has a direct plug-in into crossref so you can fill out a form and that generates metadata in crossref um and we see the larger publishers as well really committing and having whole projects to like uh wiley for example just spent a, probably a year or more gathering and formatting all of the abstracts from their 11 million uh articles and have just deposited those in crossref and abstracts are critical for that what we mentioned the meta research because it, well, first of all, it's like a shop window for your content, you know, so it tells like an advert. It tells people what the research is, is about. It's, it's a little synopsis or, um, yeah, summary. Um, and, you know, they can also be analyzed. People could apply uh, machine learning, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, to, yeah, determine subject classifications and many useful things. So I think I think we'll see other publishers trying to do large scale projects to um, format some of their metadata, even things that they wouldn't have thought of as metadata before, like abstracts. Um, you know, they would have thought that they would have thought of that as content, I think, but it is metadata, just like references. That all needs to be in Crossref and completely open and then and then anyone can use it to analyze it. So I, I'm looking forward to that steady, you know, increase as well. Yes, I'm sure uh, we are not that far from seeing that increase altogether in uh, ad adoption of metadata across platforms as well. Uh, so, 
now just speaking more into you know community over commercialization as the theme for this year's international open access week uh, one of the communities that honestly pop right up in my mind is the force 11 substream community blog uh, which you recently co-founded and i have been fortunate to have been one of the authors to have contributed uh, in the blog yeah <laughs> thank so, you as you took this initiative uh, i'm very keen on understanding what was the key motivation behind curating a community blog and how do you see it shaping the narrative of scholarly communication yeah thank you for mentioning upstream it is quite new um i have to mention the uh, other co-founders so john chidaki uh, primarily it was his idea um and he invited myself martin fenner and chris ferguson um and persuaded the force 11 board to support this um and it seemed like you know it's just a blogging platform whatever <laughs> but blogs are becoming a lot more important in science itself um and one of the upstream um editors we with sort of like a mini light touch editors group as well martin fenner also has um a service called rogue scholar where he's indexing science blogs so we all believe that blogging actually in research communications is is going to become more important um you know it's not as formal as preprints but they're very important they should be included in the literature they should have and have citations and be cited um but yeah so with upstream uh, i think you know there wasn't really one platform so some of us were finding like well our different organizations want to share want to co-write something where are we going to post it because it's not really doesn't really belong on the force 11 blog because it's nothing to do with force 11 it's nothing to do with crossref but people who have thoughts about the industry um so there wasn't really a place for open you know open research open publishing open governance open access um so we just wanted a platform that was that you know that place that anybody uh could submit to and that was the second thing as we really wanted to find and read and hear about new voices that you know I feel like Crossref and my role at Crossref introduces me to so much so such a breadth of the community from funders to government policy makers and and obviously publishers and and researchers um but we're still hearing from the same people with the same perspectives at the same conferences um and so even though it's a volunteer role so we probably haven't put you know as much effort into it just because we don't have time it really is there for anybody to kind of submit to um and yeah we want to we want to kind of pave the way so that so that these this sort of level of thinking and this direction of travel in open can we can find the next generation of um thought leaders really so it's quite a it's quite a lofty aim with just a blog with just a blogging platform but it's deliberately very low barriers like we call ourselves the, the editors group but it's quite light touch um it just has to fit the topic and be scheduled in um and yeah the readership is growing as well so it's it's still in the hundreds but it's approaching towards the thousands um so we need to turn those readers into writers <laughs> um but yeah personally you know it feels like volunteering for upstream it could shape it could shape the community and the discussion um around open science in future but we really definitely need more uh more perspectives and more diverse perspectives than than what we're getting at the moment yes yes absolutely and you know providing a platform as such which is not uh, confining the writers to writing just original research based uh, content but also giving them an opportunity uh, to lay out the narrative their perspectives their opinions yes. and yeah. producing let's say thought leaders out of it will yeah. really create a great revolution in the industry itself with mm -hmm. people getting a platform to speak about different for example the kind of challenges that they may have faced and the ways in which they have overcome it so mm -hmm. the readers would i believe will definitely overcome from it would, and would at least definitely learn something out of every blog that's there on the platform oh brilliant yeah and some of, some of it's just like oh this is a, a convenient like it's a convenient platform to have a joint like matt bays uh, from data site and myself um blogged something last week because it wasn't 
only data site or only cross draft. So we're like, okay, this is a convenient um, venue. Um, but there's other topics on there about, yeah, the experience of uh, entering the uh, scholarly communications uh, ecosystem and experiences of scholarly marginalization. And these are really important um, stories for, for everybody to hear. So, as we speak more on increasing the amount of open infrastructure across platforms, and how do you think can organizations strike a balance between sustainability and the principles of openness, especially in the context of developing and maintaining scholarly infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really hard actually because um, everyone you everyone in our normal day-to-day -day lives, um, you know, airport books and things are talking about monetization of data and um, how to monetize AI, how to, how to monetize all the time. And actually we do not think about how to monetize things. I, I think most, even the big commercial publishers are not always thinking how to monetize this, how to monetize that. They are thinking how to add value whilst remaining sustainable and so for the ones that were based on commercial models that's a much harder shift um and of course you know some of them are deliberately being slow you know sort of dragging their feet but others are really not um but in terms of infrastructure you know it's not free to run um and the scale of crossref at the moment for example we have 150 million records that we have to look after each record is getting bigger and bigger every year as people add abstracts or whatever and you know nobody really thinks about that because they're completely free to use and more metadata is better but crossref's costs are rising because you know next year we're budgeting nearly a million us dollars just for data storage and processing so because we have billions more users and api queries um you know that we need to support those technically. Um, we also need to support those people. So we have, you know, we use contractors for technical support and the costs are really are really are rising. But um, so is the investment in Crossref. Um, so it's, I feel a really good example, actually. Crossref reached sustainability 20 years ago after about three years, I think, of operation. And of course it had loans and it had, massive investment mostly from the large publishers and societies um but now we have nearly 20,000 organizations you know Elsevier and Taylor and Francis are just one two three you know five big organizations but they get the same single vote as the other 20,000 organizations or or increasingly individuals um you know so it really has seen a huge community investment and pretty much unchallenged sort of support so it's just a way of life now and so because dois are you know ubiquitous and it's expected right that's that's how people link things together um in research they are they are sort of expected to be free because they are free at the point of use they're free to use um for many people they're free to create as well um so it's just a way of life now with digital communications to, to to use this infrastructure behind the scenes. And so people don't really see the small team that we have trying to keep things running. And um, yeah, but it's going in a good direction. You know, it's it's we're getting more support from more corners of the organization. Funders especially are really um, interested now in um, not necessarily funding Crossref, but contributing their open metadata about um, grants and about the um, the projects that they are funding. So yeah, it's expanding and it's growing, um, which has cost implications, but also it makes it, there's more of a, you know, united kind of support for, for that, for Crossref as an infrastructure anyway, which is, which is really good. <laughs> Um, I also like. I definitely agree with the fact that you know, funders do play a major role in you know advancing scholarly communication and research in itself altogether. But again, researchers are not that aware of where to find the right funds, and uh, they just get into that whole puzzle wherein 
oh, where should I go? What should I look for? Will I be eligible for it? And all of these things. And in that process, um, we recently conducted an, uh, a survey, a global survey, where we realized that people were not even aware of publication funds, which is, you know, uh, which is kind of uh, constraining them from actually going ahead and publishing in open access platforms, which mm-hmm. will gain their research uh, more amount of, you know, recognition and, you know, the visibility would increase and eventually the advancement in science will increase as well. But uh, this lack of awareness is something that I think all of us as, as a community should uh, really consider uh, mm. just to propel and, you know, ensure that the advancement in science just shoots out to another galaxy probably. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, um, as we celebrate the International Open Access Week this month, uh, what's that one advice you'd like to give to scholars, publishers, and institutions looking to actively contribute and benefit from the open access movement in the years to come? Yeah, I think, you know, thinking about what you just said about scholars kind of like not being aware of their options, it's a real shame that a scholar has to do research (laughs) in advance of just kind of like, you know, they have to think about that instead of the actual progress that they're making in a scientific field. Um, But there are more tools now that should be looked at. And I would highlight one called OA Report. Um, It's OA.Report and it's led by Spark, I think sort of US European initiative. And it shows dashboards at the institution level. So even the institutions you're working with are now being assessed on how open they are. So how, what proportion of published papers that came out of that institution are open access? And they're also looking at open metadata and, and policies and things like that as well. So I think institutions have the most the most to do, <laughs> I would say, in supporting open access fully. Funders, for sure, as well. You know, funders are mandating where they can. Um, and there's there's tools and initiatives that are trying to help people share information about, okay, was this an APC funded? Um, you know, was the APC included in the grant? Things like that. But we need more open dashboards at the institution level, I think. Um, and I would love to see, I think individual scholars, let's not give them more work to do. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe I would say for an individual scholar, just be aware that you are like part of a wider movement and any tiny choice you make really can, really can make a difference. Um, it's like, you know, it's like voting in an, ele- in an election or something. And every, every vote counts, not always every vote counts. But this feels like, you know, a small choice could make a big impact if everybody kind of thinks of themselves as part of the wider ecosystem. But I I would say institutions, I would love to see universities and university bodies and um, management challenge themselves um, a little bit more about the incentives that they're supporting and just come together more for, for open science. Um, there's a lot of pressure on publishers to do this, that, and then they're right in the middle. But institutions are at the beginning and at the end with the creators and the and the consumers of research. And so their role needs to needs to be, um, I think, yeah, a little bit more coordinated and uh, I'd love to see that. <laughs>